But I think that um, the regional cooperation is absolutely key in those, not only in this region, but yeah. also in this region. And it's true that um, um, because of um, the question of customs, the question of all the barriers to trade, the barriers to all those aspects can be solved progressively through this cooperation within the region. After that, of course, it's also with the EU. But first of all, in the region, it's important to really try to work against uh, various barriers. Uh, it's also true for young entrepreneurs. It's easier to start to develop a market uh, in the region than just start with the, the international uh, trade. I think that the regional approach is a, a good step for small entrepreneurs in order to develop their business uh, outside of just their small uh, environment first. Secondly, uh, it's something which is, of course, useful regarding the way to develop the relationship with the EU as such, and the regional cooperation framework is there to do that and to work on that. And finally, I think that um, it's true that now with the war in Ukraine and all what is happening also in the region with inflation, uh, poverty, and all those problems, more than ever, cooperation is important because maybe all diamonds, the demons could uh, come back. And it's true that now the cooperation is something which is absolutely key true concrete issues. I think that, uh, of course, it's not easy to, uh, to create uh, the, the regional cooperation, even if it's requested by all of us. Nevertheless, working on concrete issues where progress could be made and also felt by the population as something which is easier after the cooperation than before, it's something which, uh, which is key. And finally, just to react to what said Armin about diaspora, I think that it's a good thing that diaspora could really come back, help, uh, uh, and trying to develop projects which can be followed by national people or people living um, uh, or staying in the country. And that's the good part of migration. Sometimes in the EU, we are looking about migration through the angle of, oh, what's that? that's a problem. But it's also something which is very useful when you think about a circular migration. It's really important to that people from the diaspora could help or start something which can encourage uh, national uh, entrepreneurs or young people or women to start something uh, uh, with the support of the diaspora. So I think that it's, it's not a, a bad consequence. It's something which could be really really useful, but I'm totally convinced that even in the world with the new powers and Russia, China, and all what discussed in the previous panel, more than ever, the regional cooperation on all aspects, of course, export, trade, uh, economic issues, but more than that, it's something which is absolutely um, useful for the balance uh, in the region and the relationship between this region, the EU, and the rest of the world. So, yes, I, I, been, I am a big uh, uh, advocate for regional cooperation. Speaking about regional cooperation, uh, I would like to emphasize the importance of the establishment of the steering platform for research and innovation for the Western Balkan, which is an important strategic body to deal with European multilateral and regional issues on research and innovation policies in and with the Western Balkan. This platform has an important role as an information exchange center where national developments and best practices are presented, discussed, and exchanged. So uh, the Western Balkan Innovation Agenda and the association of the Western Balkan countries in, to the uh, Horizon Europe program, for example, mark a crucial achievement in such a context. But the agenda, the common agenda of the Western Balkan include also um, common action in the green economy, green agenda, open science, smart specialization strategy, and so on. So we have a lot in common as a region. And it's important to uh, coordinate our action and to integrate in the region and then the region into the European Union. If I may uh, tackle the question of uh, criteria of admission, either uh, relaxing them or making them more stringent. Uh, Latvia was part uh, of uh, the Big Bang expansion of 10 countries being accepted at once. And the European Commission, after the fact, in the next few years, uh, concluded that two out of these 10 were not at the same level of readiness 
four European standards, if you like, uh, than the other eight. And at that time, it was decided uh, that for the next en uh, enlargements, uh, uh, no uh, lowering of standards would be admitted for whatever reason, but that uh, one would strictly, uh, and if you like, bureaucratically uh, stick to what the demands of the European Union were for becoming a member. Because it is now, you, you become part of a whole where everybody else is concerned by what happens in any one of the members. So that, if you like, what happens in North Macedonia or in Albania or, uh, or in Kosovo, uh, once they become members of the European Union, is of equal concern to other countries in the Union, both North, South, East and West. Uh, so far, the attitude had been that the more, if you like, especially now that there's a, a war in Ukraine, I think inevitably the questions of security, be it the ability to control and ensure the internal security of one's citizens, or the foreign policy attitudes towards what is happening in Ukraine, would be uh, factors taken into consideration. And if the whole European Union has decided that Ukraine has been attacked without basis and reason, and uh, international law has been broken by what is being uh, done there by the army of the Russian Federation, then any country who supports the Russian effort and thinks that it's a wonderful thing is clearly not in tune with the values of Europe. And automatically, uh, I think in the mind of men, citizens of many countries besides mine own, uh, would say this country has not answered to the European standards. And this goes on for other uh, elements as well. Control of organized crime, control of corruption, what measures have been taken uh, to reduce uh, the young woman was talking about clientelism and, and, and so on and corruption. These are serious matters. You cannot have good governance unless these questions are tackled. Yeah, on the risk on relaxing the criteria, of course. Um, on the other hand, enlargement always functioned in the way that um, you have to be really strict on criteria, and sometimes you have to be also really strict in timing. Um, this is, by the way, a reason not to give you a date. <laughs> um, the grand rule of enlargement, never give a date, at least not much too early. Um, and now it would be for sure much too early. We have to be really keen on the criteria. Um, on the other hand, sometimes you also need to invest some trust into a society to hold the ball rolling, to give the believing. I think in the Western Balkans, to be honest, in the moment, we are far away from this classical logics of enlargement in the Central Eastern European states. We have to first build back credibility of the European Union that we want to enlarge, and we will. And therefore, it is, I think, really decisive that my government is having such a clear, also emotional standpoint on that. But of course, we know that many politicians in the region would like to be geopolitically integrated immediately without undertaking democracy or rule of law. But everybody who is an expert on the European Union knows the internal market is the core of this. And one of the most important engines is the Commission, European Parliament, but also the court. And uh, we need to have clear legal grounds executed and being valid on the ground everywhere in the Union. Otherwise, we can put the Union also to the garbage bin. So we have to be strict on criteria, but we also have to be knowing that enlargement always was also the creating and the using of momentum. Um, so now we have this problem on Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, where Germany is having a standpoint to be more to be clear on the criteria. I don't know exactly how the other countries in the council are. We have a proposal from the commission. How to execute this well? Good question. Yeah. If we talk about the 2004 enlargement, 
Um, why it was on the 1st May and not on the 1st January? Do you remember? Ms. Uh, Ms. President for sure will remember. Yeah? Uh, I think we almost screwed it up then. I mean, I'm, well, I was really young, but I think 1st of uh, January 2005, many countries would have said, no thanks, too late. Yeah? On the other hand, we also got perhaps more out in this round than in the 2007 round, where we were perhaps too early with a fixed specific date. Um, second point, what can be the region doing better? Good news would be great. Uh, good news give us also confidence in the region. And sometimes it is important for us to create good news among the region and you don't mind about your domestic politics at home. Second is um, the main point in Central Eastern Europe in that time was that every politician where you would have the impression that he or she is not delivering approximation to the European Union would be dismissed in the next elections for sure. So there was a huge leverage by us. Um, and I think this could be a contribution of the region to be more clear on that. Who's talking bad about Europe will not be elected again. Uh, doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, by the way. Yeah? And this is valid for different antipodes in the region, by the way. Yes. Just Answer a it. short short note. Um, so if we're not willing to take a risk, what's the alternative geopolitically? 